Hello. Okay. This is my second time trying to record my voice. I gotta try to watch the time. This is something I wanted to do for a while, and I've actually attempted a couple of times. And that is basically just recording myself talking, walking at night, maybe just sitting outside at night. Because I walk a lot and listen to teachings, and sometimes, you know, I'm meditating on the Bible, certain verses, and, and uh, you know, I get these ideas and stuff, and it's like, I wish I was recording this right now so I could share this. Uh, so anyways, I thought it would be a good idea, and there's some other people that do stuff like this, like James Patel is walking, talking pulpit. Right now, this first one that I'm going to try to upload, I'll probably just be ranting or talking about random stuff for 30 minutes. I don't know if I'm going to go too much into verses and stuff, but maybe I'll do different things, different nights. Maybe I'll get a few verses that I'll go over and I'll try to meditate on them and expound on them or something. Uh, but anyway, so I've got about a 30 minute time limit. What I'm doing is I'm recording it on my iPhone my cracked iPhone that I started recording videos and putting on YouTube with. It's still really useful. It's not the main phone that I use, but... Anyways, I bought a microphone for my computer, I think, and it wasn't a powered microphone, so it didn't work. But I found that it could be used for the iPhone, so... I'm trying to get use out of this, and... I think it'll be good to record walk and talks like this, because... It will encourage me to get out and walk more. It will encourage me to meditate on scripture more. And I'll be put, uploading more videos on YouTube, hopefully consistency. This might be something I'll do every night. You know, I might miss out some nights, not do it. I might do it like twice in a night. I don't know. i got to see how it all works out. But last night I went and talked, and I talked about a bunch of different things, and I went for about 40 minutes, and... What I'm doing is I'm recording on my iPhone, MP3, and then I'm going to send it to my mail, and then download it on my computer from my mail, and then use a website to upload it onto YouTube where I, I can add a picture and I can add an MP3 file, but the MP3 file has to be under 30 minutes, so. But that's a good time anyways. It's probably longer than people want to listen to me rant. But like I said, hopefully, I'll think of some little studies. Uh, I don't really know what to talk about tonight. <laughs> so I got about 25 minutes. Last night, I just was talking about some things that I'm planning on doing with the whiteboard and some teachings and stuff. I want to talk about Abraham's bosom, this teaching that there was two compartments in hell before Jesus died. And then, you know, after Jesus resurrected, he took the, the second compartment of hell, the good compartment, paradise slash Abraham's bosom, and took it up to heaven. And I don't believe that is true. I think that's a false doctrine. It's a very popular false doctrine, and it's probably one that I've mentioned or maybe slightly taught in the past. But I've always been kind of curious about it. And uh, there's not a whole lot of verses that deal with it, maybe like six of them or so. But after examining them, thinking about some stuff, thinking about these verses, I think that, uh, first of all, one thing that really brought this to my attention recently, again, is I was listening to a clip with Steven Anderson and James White te or talking to each other. And, you know, Steven Anderson says that Jesus suffered in hell. That's a false doctrine. You know, I definitely... I want to talk about that and refute that as well. It's even worse. But James White, he believes in the Abraham's bosom thing, that there was two compartments in hell. And James, or Stephen Anderson said to James White, I can show you, like, the, you know, the saints in the Old Testament, they went to heaven. He's like, I can show you, like, every time the Bible mentions hell, it's always a bad place. And I was like, yeah, that seems pretty right. You know, hell's never really talked to talked about as a good place as far as I remember so I don't know that just kind of got me to think about it a little more and so you know Stephen Anderson's right I think that there's only heaven and hell 
There was no two compartments in hell, but then he's wrong, saying that Jesus went to hell and suffered in hell. And I'll talk about the verses, why people come to these conclusions. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to go over that like I did last night when I first recorded it. Uh, uh, I don't even know what to talk about now. I didn't really think it, think it out too much, but... One of the main things that people get confused about, including myself before I thought about it more, is that Jesus told the thief on the cross, like, today you'll be with me in paradise. So Jesus was going to paradise after he died. Then there's another verse that says that, you know, Jesus would go to the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So people take these two and try to combine them together. Uh, They take that he went to the heart of the earth literally, and they think that the heart of the earth is like the center of the earth, and they think that that's where hell is. So, like, how do you reconcile these things? That Jesus went to paradise, but he also went to hell, they think. So they come up with that, and then there's a passage in Luke 16 or Luke 17 that talks about Abraham's bosom. But these two verses that Jesus said he would be in paradise and that he would go to the heart of the earth or it's like comparing like apples and oranges they're talking about like different things okay, Jesus' spirit would go to be with his father his soul in heaven and what it's talking about him being in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights is basically uh, that, he would, that he would be dead physically that he would be buried that's the kind of language that's, it's like a figurative language that he's going to the heart of the earth. Um, and there's other verses that are involved that people get confused to. Jesus said that no man ascended, no man has ascended into heaven. And, you know, he's basically saying that, you know, that only he has the understanding from heaven to teach the things that he's teaching. That's basically what he's saying. He's not saying that the Old Testament saints didn't go to heaven. Um, you know, as far as the passage just talking about Abraham's bosom, that I've got to examine more. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell, you know, what's literal, what's, what's figurative there. But you know, the rich man, Lazarus, went to a place of suffering and torment, where he's being tormented by the flame. The rich and the poor man went to be, he was in Abraham's bosom, which means that, you know, he was with Abraham. He was being comforted by Abraham. Um, And so they would be in heaven, and the great chasm would be, you know, between heaven and hell. And so you say, well, the guy in hell, he's talking to the poor man in heaven, right? So, you know, does that mean that people can talk back and forth between heaven and hell? I don't know. Maybe that's just Jesus trying to get an idea across. Okay, so maybe that part's not literal. Uh, He's just trying to get this idea across that the person in hell, you know, he's in torment, he really doesn't want to be there, but there's nothing he can do about it. You can't cross. And you know, the, the guy who's in hell dislikes it so much that he wants other people to be warned about it. So I think that it's just kind of like an idea that Jesus is trying to get across. These could be actual people who, you know, died and, and one went to hell and one went to heaven, but maybe not all these events, you know, are, are to be literal. And even the flames, you know, I have a hard time understanding, you know, if the flames are literal. Uh, because, you know, Jesus talks about hell being like darkness, but flames emit light. And so it's like, well, what kind of flames are these, you know? And I said the verse that says, their worm dieth not, that could be their guilty conscience that's eating away at them. Okay, like maggots would eat away at a physical rotting corpse. But, But he's trying to express, you know, a spiritual idea. So... I want to examine these things more, but uh, it's a popular doctrine 
the Abraham's wisdom doctrine that is it's false and one of the main reasons that I believe that at first is because I read it on got questions and you know I said got questions has a lot of good stuff but it's got a lot of bad stuff too they're Calvinists they're not King James only you know they're for all the traditions of men the church system they teach that the sons of God in the Old Testament were angels who mated with women <laughs> they teach Abraham's bosom they teach loss of rewards and these are three doctrines that really bug me because they're so popular but anyway um, got to take a moment to think. Just finished watching some documentaries with my mom uh, from the BBC and they're called um, The Victorian Farm. There's like six parts to it. It's pretty cool shows how, how in the old time how they did stuff on the farm it's crazy how much we've advanced and how they're so busy all the time working we have it pretty easy today but uh it's crazy just thinking about like when you're really busy doing stuff you realize like how how little time we have like in the day <laughs> You know, in the week and time goes by fast and like when I'm really busy working on the website and there's studies that I'm doing and like things are going really great making videos like I want to do so much more but I can't like it's just so much time and sometimes it's like I don't even want to sleep like I just want to keep going but recently I've been kind of like less motivated and a little, I don't know, fatigued, I guess, for some reason. And now the weather is getting cooler. I love it. I love the fall. I'm so excited. And I'll probably do some fasting again this October. I mean, Halloween's a pretty bad time. Uh, kids being kidnapped and animals being tortured and probably people being tortured and, you know all, all kinds of things that you can imagine all kinds of wickedness on Halloween and that whole the whole time <sighs> so you know, people need our prayers and God definitely listens to prayers and God acts uh, and I think, you know, when the saints all get together and pray, it's, it's pretty powerful. I want to talk more about easy believism, too, in the future and do more studies on that. I think people, you know, I've heard people say that the whole debate about easy believism, about repentance and stuff, is not really a big deal. And... All it does is, all it is is like quarreling and everything, but I disagree. And at the same time, there's a lot of people who would dislike me exposing all kinds of false doctrines and false teachers, saying that everything that I'm doing is really minuscule. But they would say, like, if it has to do with salvation, then it's really important or whatever. And it is. It is really important if it's concerning salvation. Uh, but I think people still don't really understand what easy believism is and stuff, and there's many different variations of it. And uh, I still have a lot to learn about it too. But basically, I mean, they twist a lot of verses like they try to say that you can be saved yet not be a disciple of Jesus. So the verses when Jesus says, like, Whoever wants to be my disciple, you must, you know, take up your cross and, and, and follow me. They'll say that's not a salvation passage, okay? So really, you can, you can choose to trust God, believe God, and, and you can be saved. 
But at the same time, you, you don't have to come to God. You don't have to submit to God. You can be totally, like, opposed to God. And, you know, just say, yeah, I believe he died for my sins and now I'm saved. <laughs> uh, no. You have to come to God. You have to humble yourself. You have to submit to him. Um, also, you know, they talk about, they'll say that there can be fruitless Christians. So they'll misinterpret the parable of the sower. And, uh, you know, there's like four examples, like the one on the rock or the stony ground, where the devil, you know, takes the seed away, takes the, the word away, it never gets planted, it never gets rooted, it never produces fruit. Then there's the second one that, uh, you know, the sun, the sun kills it. It doesn't, it doesn't get rooted and it dries up quickly and dies. It's those who believe and then they fall away. They believe for a while and they fall away in a time of temptation or trial, right? And then there's the one that's in the thorny ground. They get choked up with the cares of this life. And none of those produce any fruit. And then, like, the fourth one's the one where the seed lands on the good ground, the only one that's good, the only one that produces fruit. And, and sometimes they produce more fruit or less fruit, but they all produce fruit. And you have to wonder, you know, what is Jesus trying to say with this parable? You know? <laughs> and... The easy believism people will try to say that at least like the second one, or the third one, and the fourth one are all saved people, even though the second and third one don't produce any fruit. And no, <laughs> you know the word of God never took root in them, so it never produced fruit. So those kind of people are not saved. And of course, you know they'll twist repentance. They'll twist many other things. You know. The verses that say, you know, no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. And, you know, it gives a list, no drunkards, no fornicators, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll say that, you know, well, these people, they, they're saved, they just, uh, you know, they lose rewards or they lose their inheritance. Or There's different variations on all these, and not all of them go for the same things. But... I mean, to twist that much of the Bible and more, I would say it's pretty serious. So, I've got about 10 minutes left. But one of the main things I look for in easy believism is somebody teaches that repentance doesn't mean to turn from sin. Or if somebody says you need to turn from sin and, and turn to God to be saved, then your teaching works. And that, that's someone who's teaching easy believism to me. Um, but that's not always the case. Unfortunately, there are those who say, yeah, you do have to turn from your sin to be saved. And it's like, amen. And, uh, But then they'll teach the other things that I just talked about, like the parable of the sower. They'll interpret it like an easy believism person was. They'll say, you know, well, there can be fruitless Christians. An example of this would be Rick Jacoby. He teaches that repentance means to turn from sin, but yet he grasps a lot of the easy believism teachings. Um, you know, there's also, as far as fruit, there's the, in like John 15, I think, I don't know. But somewhere in John, you know, Jesus says, I am the vine, you're the branches, you know, whatever branch in me doesn't produce fruit is cut off and burned. And, you know, Rick Jacoby says, those are Christians, the, those branches that are in Jesus that don't produce any fruit and they're burned, those are just, you know, uh, bad Christians or whatever. <laughs> uh, no, that's not the idea. Okay? Um, those who are in Jesus with no fruit that are cut off and burned, they just appear to be in Jesus, just like those who believed for a while and then fell away. They did not produce any fruit either. And they didn't produce any fruit because it never took the word never took root in them. They never truly had saving faith. You know, true repentant faith that led to salvation, that led to them being regenerated. 
and really these easy believers and people, they have a problem with regeneration, with their understanding of you know what it means to be born again. Uh, but it's just an awesome night out, and I hope that in the future when I do this, hopefully tomorrow again, I'll start having more ideas about what I'm going to talk about, but I don't want to get into it a whole lot, but one of the reasons I mentioned the Easy Believism thing again too is because I think unfortunately that Dave Hunt, who I have said is a good teacher multiple times, and I read his books, and I do he does teach a lot that's really good, but unfortunately uh, I think that he does hold to some of those Easy Believism teachings. Uh, he does teach that you must repent of your sins to be saved, and, and that it means to turn and all that good stuff, but he also teaches that Christians can be fruitless and stuff, and, you know, it's because of his misunderstanding of some verses. But it's a little troublesome to me. It's unfortunate. But I'll talk about that in the future. I have to examine him a lot more uh, before I say a whole lot more, but... But I think that I'll have some pretty good teachings with the whiteboard. And uh, tomorrow I'm getting a new webcam. I don't know how much better it's going to be. I'm probably still going to use the hand cam to record videos on the whiteboard. But uh, I don't know really how this webcam is going to be. I've tried looking up um, reviews and stuff, but I can't really tell until it actually gets here how it's going to be. But... If anything, it'll be a little better than the webcam that I have. When I record at the desk, the lighting and stuff will be better, but... Oh, wow. But it's just awesome being outside. And I'm probably going to end this and see how long it's going to take to upload. It's probably about 25 minutes now, close to around that time. But if you listen all the way through this, then uh, just know that this is just the beginning of me hopefully starting to do this on a daily basis, and uh, I'll try to talk about things better. So, God bless. <laughs>